Hey, hello everyone. Welcome to our third Facebook Live presentation. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight. We are coming back to you again to do Q&A, and I hope you've been saving up your questions. Uh, I, whenever I travel and I teach in other places, we found that one of the highlights of the speaking I would do was the Q&A time that we usually offered at the end of whatever the presentation was. And it became the case that in many cases, people liked the Q&A more than they did the presentation. So we've learned that there are a lot of people in a lot of churches around the world who have questions about the Bible. And I guess for whatever reason, they can't get those answers in their own church or from their pastor or whoever, and they come to us. And we're happy to be the ones who answer those questions if no one else will. And we've started to do these Facebook Live Q&A sessions as another way of reaching out to those who follow the ministry and want to hear more from us. Uh, now that travel is so much more difficult, we thought this would be a better way to at least continue to offer you know, good content, good Q&A content. So we've been doing that now for a couple of times. This is our third time, and uh, we're getting more interest each time, so we're just going to keep doing it. So as we usually do, if you have a question for me, uh, you just submit it through our Facebook page. Now, I am not checking what you say on Facebook. I'm not looking at that stream while I'm doing this. We have other people in the ministry who are doing that for me right now, and then they are sending me the questions that they believe are the best suited ones for me to answer. So uh, give your questions in the Facebook commentary uh, on our page, and we'll do our best to get to every one of them. And uh, the ones that are sent to me will be the ones I will answer. So we are already ready to go. We have a couple of questions that came in just before we started, so people were already queuing them up, and I'm thankful for that so that we can get going. Let me pray briefly with you, and then we'll begin to answer the scriptures, uh, answer the questions you have from scripture. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this audience, wherever they are, wherever they are, are seated right now, connected by the internet, but made one in the body by the Spirit, and we thank you, Father, for that unity, even in our separation. Lord, I pray you be teaching each of us tonight by your word and by your spirit. And uh, let me, Father, speak a words according to your will for the benefit of your children who come to you with questions. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, let's go to one of the questions that came in early. We were asked earlier uh, what the purpose of the thousand-year reign of Christ is. Well, that's a, a question with a large answer, actually. But for the purpose of tonight, let me make it simple. Uh, we know that the Bible promises in Psalms that Jesus will have an opportunity to reign over all his enemies, putting all enemies under his authority, in subjection to his authority. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus must reign until the last of his enemies, that is, death itself and Satan, would be put under his authority. So the kingdom is the opportunity for God to show the world how his son will rule the world in perfection. He is perfect. He is ruling with perfect justice. So it's a witness to the world of how God will rule. And there's an interesting little uh, connection between the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth, which is still to come, and our, term, our time right now on earth. The general chronology of the Bible puts our current world at around 6,000 years old, give or take. And we know we're close to the end of the age. All the signs are there now that tell us that the end of the age is upon us. So it's not very long from now before Christ returns and the second coming happens and then we have the kingdom. So when it's all said and done, it may end up being the case that there were about 6,000 years of rule for sinful man trying to rule ourselves on earth, doing a terrible job of it, as you can see in the world today. And then we'll get 1,000 years of Jesus ruling the earth, demonstrating what perfect justice and perfect rule actually looks like. And of course, six plus one is seven. So then at the conclusion of the thousand year reign of Christ, earth will have existed for 7,000 years, the number of completion, and then will be the end of the earth and the coming of the new heavens and new earth. So it's an interesting consideration if the numbering works out just right, that God is doing this in a way that testifies to the six, number six means the sinfulness of man. So the sinfulness of man juxtaposed with the perfection of God, and you get to see who really knows how to rule. So that's the 
chief purpose of the millennial kingdom. By the way, there are many other purposes for Israel, for the church. It's a, a time in which God is accomplishing many things, but at the heart of it is for Jesus to rule the world. Good question. Thank you for that one. Uh, looking at uh, the next question, uh, one of the earlier ones that came in said uh, or asked the question, if Christians are to be ready for the Lord's return and we are to receive rewards for our service, what does that mean for a brand new believer? Uh, or for those who have very little time as believers, like children, before the coming of the Lord? Well, the Bible and, and Jesus anticipates this. In fact, in the way the Bible describes our judgment moment for rewards, the judgment seat of Christ, we're told in the parables of the talents and the parables of the minas in both Matthew and Luke that Jesus takes into account the opportunity that we have to serve, such that those who have more opportunity will therefore expect, be expected to have done more with it. All of that can be summed up by one statement that Jesus makes, to whom much is given, much will be required. So he, it is a proportional judgment. He takes into account how long you've been a Christian, how many opportunities you had, and you know we can see in history examples of people who we can assume will have a higher expectation placed upon them because of the greater opportunities that they received. Uh, you can imagine men like um, uh, the Apostle Paul or Martin Luther or maybe Billy Graham, uh, somebody like that who accomplished a lot, they had a lot of opportunity, they lived a long time, and as a result we would expect that God had very high uh, expectations on them. But if they met those expectations, then they'll be well rewarded. And on the other end of the spectrum, you could use the thief on the cross as the ultimate example of someone who had very little opportunity. He was hanging on a cross for just a few hours. And from what we can tell, those may have been the only hours that he was a believer. But in that short time, he did everything that you might expect someone in his situation to do. He evangelized to the only unbeliever that was within earshot, and that was the other thief, when he told the other thief that this man, Jesus, had done nothing wrong, that he was Lord. And then the second thing he did was he praised and glorified his Lord by turning to Jesus and honoring him by saying, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So in a sense, that man could do little more than he did. But again, given his opportunity, we might assume he will be equally well rewarded as some of those other people I mentioned. Because his uh, role was to serve Jesus within the limits of what Jesus gave him to do. And I should add, by the way, of, uh, uh, of all the people you might name since the apostles, people like Martin Luther or Billy Graham, none of them are mentioned in Scripture, but the thief on the cross is recorded in Scripture. So clearly that man's impact was significant, even though he was only on the cross for a short time. So that's how God will fairly judge everyone, by their opportunity to serve and what they did with it. Good question again. Thank you. All right. Uh, we're looking at uh, new questions now, questions that have started to come in since we started the live stream tonight. By the way, we've been doing these for about uh, 30 minutes up till now, but uh, we thought we'd go a little longer tonight and see if we can uh, make more use of the time since we're all here together. So we will uh, be running closer to an hour tonight. That gives us more time for your questions. And by the way, if we don't get to your question, don't forget, you can always submit that to us through the website, and we have people who answer those questions for you, and we'll get back to you as soon as we can with that personal reply. All right, back to the questions. Uh, looking down to the next one, why doesn't the Bible mention what the chaos in the world will be when the rapture happens? What will everyone who are left over think. Well, to the first part of that question, why doesn't the Bible mention uh, what the world will be going through after the rapture? Uh, well, you know, there are a lot of things that the Bible doesn't mention. It's not a history book. It doesn't try to capture every event. It's a, a book telling about certain things that the, that the Lord believes were the important things for us to know in order to serve Him well. Certainly knowing that there would be a resurrection and that at the resurrection the church would be removed from the earth, uh, that's important. Of course we needed to know that. But to know what the world will experience after that, apparently it was not important, to not important to the plan of God. 
Having said that, we can certainly speculate, although speculation is only that. It's just what it's, just somebody's idea it doesn't have any merit necessarily. But we certainly can imagine that the world will be quite um, shocked and uh, disrupted. I mean, think about how easily the world was disrupted in the last six months by a virus, how much more so when a significant number of people on the earth are no longer around uh, after an instant. But I'd also point you to the fact that there are a lot of people today that are explaining away the signs that tell us we're near the end of this age, signs that God has brought to the world to make clear that this world is not going to last and that it's intended to fall apart and to be replaced. And the world, although they can see the effect of what God is doing, think about the different ways they try to explain it away. And they will be doing similar things in the case of the rapture. They'll be explaining it in some way so as to avoid the obvious explanation. So that's about as much speculation as I would probably give you on that point. Uh, a gentleman named Mark asked us, if someone wanted to do their own verse-by-verse -verse study of a book uh, in the same way that verse-by-verse -verse ministry teaches, how would you suggest they approach this? Uh, do we use commentaries, etc.? Well, first of all, the, the question of how you study the Bible is, that's a whole you know, semester class, probably. In fact, here at my church in San Antonio, I'm currently at my office here in my church at San Antonio, uh, we teach a, a course periodically called How to Study the Bible, and uh, we do it over a period of weeks. And I use that time to explain to those here in my church the kind of methods I use, the kind of materials I might you know, try to uh, supplement with the Bible and so on. And it takes a while, and it takes hours, and we do a lot of hands-on work together, and that's really the only way to answer that question in, in full form. I mean, it, it, in some ways, it's kind of like asking a doctor uh, you know, how do you perform heart surgery? Well, the answer is not something he can give you in a coffee table conversation, but, but at a high level, uh, studying the Bible verse by verse is a discipline of carefully observing the text and paying attention to the context of what you find there, the, the language cues, the geographical cues, the historical references, names, places, and so on, and putting together in your mind a story according to what those details tell you. Moving from observation into a kind of storytelling version of the text, but again true to the text, not something that you imagine on your own, and moving from there into a why question. Why is this being given to us? Why are these events happening? Why is it important? And as you do that you begin to get to the interpretation step and you do that in context with what you've already been studying before and what you're going to study next. You don't want to isolate anything from the larger story around it. And so you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of uh, moving around in the Bible, cross-referencing to understand history and background. Uh, right now we're studying in 2 Samuel on Wednesday nights, and 2 Samuel is a book of history from a certain period in Israel's existence. So understanding what's going on in 2 Samuel requires a lot of understanding of what was going on before and after in the history of Israel so that you can put the events of that one period into a context so that you can see the bigger picture. One of the things I tell anyone who wants to be a good Bible stu a student is you better be prepared to become a good student of history, uh, especially church history, but even going back into ancient history. To understand the Bible is, requires that you understand the historical context in which the events that are being written about actually happened. And I don't think anyone is a good Bible student fundamentally if you are not also a student of history because you cannot possibly imagine uh, or understand the circumstances that explain what's happening unless you understand the bigger picture. So be a, a curious student of history, that's another good tip. As far as commentaries and study Bibles and things like that, uh, there are some resources out there. Once in a while you'll find one that's particularly good, but I will tell you that in general there is no good commentary. There are parts of commentaries that can be good in certain sections, but no one man was ever equipped by God to know the whole Bible front to back well. So if, and that includes me, so if you are dependent on one commentary, you're going to be wrong where it's wrong, and you'll get it right when it's right, 
and you won't be learning much in the process because you're just reading somebody else's study. You should be doing your own study in which the Lord has an opportunity to speak to you through what you learn and then look at resources like ours or others as background, supplementary material, something to help give you that information that you yourself didn't have time or ability to find and then take that into consideration as well. But doing your own study is always an important part of being a disciple of Jesus. I hope that helps. If you're ever in San Antonio and you want to spend some time here with us and we're doing that study on how to study your Bible, you might enjoy hearing the whole thing then. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, someone asked me, would you share your view of the uh, United Arab Emirates and Bahrain peace treaties with uh, Israel right now? Well, uh, let me caution you first. Um, it's tempting, anytime there's some news from the Middle East, to assume that something happening in the Middle East must be related to biblical prophecy. But the reality is that almost none of it is. Almost never is anything in the Middle East related to biblical prophecy. The Bible's very clear on what to look for when it comes to the events of the Middle East. They're seminal events, they're major events, they are milestone events. And those are the only ones that have biblical significance. And when it comes to the end times, the events that we need to know about in the Middle East are so few, you can count them on one hand. They are, first, Israel's return to the land. Well, that happened in 1948. That one's checked off. Number two, it would be Israel gaining control of the city of Jerusalem. Well, that happened in 1967. Checked off. After that, it would be the regathering of Israel into the land in preparation for the tribulation. Well, that's happening, of course, and it, it has been happening since the late 19th century. So check that one off. And the next event, the next event that we're told to look for of any biblical significance in the Middle East is a peace treaty or covenant that will be signed between the Antichrist and Israel, which will allow Israel to return to its Temple Mount and to begin sacrificing again on that Temple Mount. The Bible also tells us that that event I just mentioned will not happen until after the church has left the earth. So we won't even be here to see that one. So those are all the signs that we're told to look for in the days before the coming of the end of the age. That's it. And of all the ones we're told to look for, they've all happened except the one that we won't be here to see. So what are these other treaties mean? I mean, go back a few years, we had the one with Egypt and Jordan before that, and now we have ones with uh, uh, you know, m uh, Muslim countries in Eastern Europe or in the Middle East. What do these mean? Well, in and of themselves, nothing. But you could say this, they are setting the table for the Antichrist. That is, each of these is a dot along a path. The path is defined by scripture, that is, Israel returning to its land, Israel gaining control again of the city of Jerusalem, ultimately Israel getting access to the Temple Mount. Those are the events that we're told to watch for in scripture, but between them we know other things will happen, and although none of those little things will mean much by themselves, they're painting a picture, they're, they're dots on a path. So to the extent that the Middle East is starting to see more and more Arab countries willing to go to peace with Israel, that is indicative of the kind of climate that must exist when the Antichrist finally gets Israel permission to get back on their temple and reaccomplish sacrifice. So that's the only event we're still waiting for. We're not going to be here to see it, but these other little events, they're not biblically significant by themselves, but they are pointing us in that same general direction. So we know we're getting closer. Hope that's helpful to you. Uh, next question. Do you think we will, uh, we will something, I can't understand the question. Do you think we will uh, see our family members in heaven? I'm not sure uh, what that refers to, but uh, uh, the people you will know in heaven will be the brothers and sisters you have in the church, in, in those who are believers, and uh, they are your family for all eternity. So the ones that you will know in heaven will be the ones that uh, believe in Jesus Christ and died as Christians uh, throughout the history of the church. 
the, anyone who dies without faith in Jesus Christ is not going to be uh, in the presence of the Lord, and uh, we will never see or hear from them again. And that is the reality of why it's so important that people believe in the one that was sent for our sake, Jesus Christ. Uh, next question. What translation of the Bible would you recommend for Bible study? Whichever one you prefer. Uh, there is way too much made of differences in Bible translations. Uh, now I'm speaking, of course, about uh, scholarly translations, those that make an effort to accurately reflect what's written in the original Greek and Hebrew texts. And among those of that sort, there are numerous Bibles that are all equally good. Uh, the ones you need to worry about are the ones that don't try to remain true to the original text, but rather they paraphrase the text and do so to the degree that they change what the Bible says and they don't give you an accurate view of the text. Um, the uh, Living Bible, for example, is not a study Bible. It's basically a commentary masquerading as a Bible. Uh, there are others of that sort. You should stay away from translations that heavily change the words of Scripture. Uh, you should stick with those translations that are true to the original text. So among those would be King James, New King James, uh, ASV, NASB, uh, HCSB, uh, the uh, Holman, I mean the, um, uh, say some others off the top of my head that you could, uh, the New English Translation. Uh, the NIV is not my favorite, but it's not bad. So these are all perfectly fine for study. They're not going to get in the way of you understanding the Bible properly. Uh, the ones that will are the ones that completely change the text. Uh, personally, I, I study from about 10 to 20 different versions of the Bible that I have access to in software, and I go between them based on where I need to, to see the text rendered a slightly different way, and that helps me sometimes. So the more, more is better in that regard. Uh, next question. Uh, in terms of current events, what does uh, what does this mean? I don't understand this question, unfortunately. In terms of current events, what does this mean in terms of the false prophet? I, I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. Um, the false prophet doesn't appear until the time of tribulation, and we're not in that time to see him, so we'll never see the false prophet. Uh, can you explain how the war in Ezekiel 38 and 39 fits into the end times? Uh, yes, very quickly, it doesn't. That war doesn't take place until the end of the millennial kingdom, the end of the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. If you want more explanation for that, please go listen to our Ezekiel study online. And in chapters 38 and 39, I go through very carefully explaining why in that chapter, in those two chapters, we can see conclusively that that battle does not happen until after the thousand years of Jesus' rule on earth is over. Next question. Uh, a gentleman named Edward asks, can you explain problems with post-millennialism? Uh, well, here, here's how I would approach that question. It may not make you feel very happy to hear this, but uh, I've always had a very basic rule of, uh, of how I operate as a teacher in my ministry. I never bother to take time to explain why other views are wrong. I only take time to explain what the Bible actually says. And I do that for two reasons. First of all, I don't have time in my study and in my teaching to research all the ways to get the Bible wrong. Uh, that's an infinite list, but I would rather spend my time understanding what the Bible actually says and then just teaching that. And of course, you may disagree and you may choose not to believe what I say. That's fine. I may be wrong, but uh, it's still a more productive use of my time. And I think, in general, it's better for the students because teaching people why something is wrong is not productive, in my mind. Teaching them what is right so that then they'll be able to recognize what is wrong is the better approach, and that's what I tend to do. Uh, there are a number of ways you can get eschatology, the study of end times, uh, incorrect. A lot of ways to go wrong when you look at that part of the Bible, uh, but only one way to go right. And I think it's much more important that we focus on that. Uh, Post-millennialism, uh, like uh, uh, amillennialism for that matter, uh, they are all seeking to see the world, see the scripture through a lens of the world. And they miss the opportunity to see what God's actually going to do because they insist on making the, the events of this world fit into their preconceived theological notions. And that's eisegesis, and that's what gets you into trouble every time. 
the best approach to scripture is to go at it with a clean slate, a blank page, no preconceived ideas, just let it talk to you and you'll see what you find. And you won't find post-millennialism when you do that. Uh, next question, when God is talking in Genesis and says it wasn't good that man would live eternally in a state of sin, why would he think it would be good to live in an eternal state of torture? All right, well, that's a provocative question. First of all, the premise uh, isn't exactly right. Uh, in Genesis, God doesn't say it wouldn't be good, it isn't good for man to live eternally in a state of sin. Uh, what the Bible says is man was created in a perfect state, and that was good. But at the point where men, in the case specifically of Adam, chose to sin, he put himself in a state in which he was due judgment. Adam put himself and all of the human race in a state in which they were no longer capable of spending time in the presence of God. God being perfect, God being just, he cannot deny himself. He, he cannot go opposite to his nature. I, I guess the best explanation for that to a human being would be to say this, your nature as a human being is to breathe air. I defy you to do otherwise. You can't. You have to breathe, and you have to breathe air. And no matter how much you might will to do something different, your will cannot overcome your nature. So you are bound by your nature, physically speaking. Well, God is all spirit. He's not physical. And in his nature, as a, an omniscient, omnipotent, all-righteous, all-just being, his nature defines his character. And in the nature of God, he cannot fail to judge sin because that would make him imperfect. You know, when we see a judge failing to hold someone accountable for their crime, we're never happy about that. We see it as unjust and wrong, and rightly so. Well, God is a perfect God, perfect in justice as well as everything else, so he has to judge sin. He has to, otherwise he would be imperfect. So when Adam fell into sin, he was in jeopardy of that judgment. What God did in love and mercy was withhold judgment and put a plan in place in which some of Adam's descendants would receive mercy, but not all. And your reference to eternal state of torture, uh, that's your preferred uh, terminology, I understand. It's not the Bible's terminology. Torture is when something unjust is happening. Someone who didn't deserve pain or suffering is being made to experience it. That's not justice. But in the Bible, the disposition of the unbeliever in an eternal state of justice, of judgment and punishment, it's not torture, it is justice. Because it is a deserved response from a holy God who has wrath for sin. And God being the perfect judge has made the perfect judgment. Now here's the good news. You don't have to be one of those people. No one has to be one of those people. That the offer to believe in Jesus is an open offer to the world right now. All who will receive that are covered by his sacrifice in your place, and you will not experience the judgment you deserve. So you need not fear or worry that this judgment is something you cannot escape. You can escape it with a simple set of words that come out of your mouth, as Paul says in Romans 10, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. That alone would remove the wrath of God from anyone who makes that confession. So God has made a way for some of Adam's descendants to escape the justice they deserve for their sin, while others have, unfortunately, suffered the penalty they deserve for their sin. And that is in the plan of God. All right, let's move on. Why has God chosen to resurrect church, the believers in the church, with bodies at the rapture, since our Savior already resurrected? And why not just wait until his day at the end of great tribulation when he will reign there here on earth? Well, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by the question, but I think I understand. So just to recap here for a second. The Bible doesn't have the word rapture. We may have all heard that already. Why? Because that's a word we invented. What, what does the Bible actually say? The Bible says that for every believer there must be a resurrection. We are two parts. We are spirit and we are body. 
When Adam fell in sin, he took his spirit and he brought it under condemnation. And being under condemnation for sin is a state of being that the Bible calls dead, spiritually dead. Why does it call it being dead? Because you are in a state of condemnation, outside the fellowship of God, unable to correct your problem. And you will suffer the second death if you're not uh, restored to the, the state of innocence that, you, that Adam once had. So you, you're spiritually dead, but then after Adam sinned, God pronounced a curse on the physical earth and all that came from it, which means at that moment, Adam's body was put under a sentence of death. Adam's body was not dying because of the sin that he accomplished in the garden. It's dying because God put it under a curse. So now God has said, your spirit died when you sinned, and I'm going to kill your body too. But he did that so that he could replace both of them. And just as Adam's spirit died first and then later his body, so also are we renewed in the same order. First, we're renewed in the spirit. When we believe in Jesus Christ, the Bible says we are born again. But it's referring to our spirit. Our spirit is returned to the state of innocence that it once had under Adam. We become like Christ in our spirit. Romans chapter 6 says that we have the, not, the mind of God, the knowledge of God. We have the heart of God at that point. We are able to keep the law in our heart, in our spirit, because our spirit is now like Christ. And that happens to every believer at the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. But we still have this old body, this body that is still corrupted by sin, still under the curse of death. And the Bible says that that body, once it's gone, will be replaced also with a new eternal body. And that happens at the moment called the resurrection, when we receive a new physical, eternal, sinless body. So here we are today as believers in between the two moments. We have our new spirit, but we don't have our new body yet. So we're all waiting for this day when our new body will be given to us. And the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, at the end of chapter 12, I'm sorry, the uh, end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12. Go back and look at that section of Hebrews, and you see the writer there saying that we are all waiting for God to fulfill his promises to us, just like those who waited in the old times for their promises. And he says that God has decided that no one in the church is going to receive their new body until we all are available to receive it together. No one gets it early. There's no cutting in line. No one gets an advantage. You can be one of those believers who came to faith at Pentecost in the first century, or you can be the very, very last believer who comes to faith of a mere minute before Christ returns for the church. Both of those people are going to get their new bodies at the same moment, at a moment called the resurrection. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15. And that moment, when it happens, will be instantaneous, Paul says. All those who have ever died and lived and died in the church will be with Christ in the heavenly realm, in the sky, and they will receive new bodies instantly. And then shortly thereafter, those of us who are still alive on the earth when this moment happens, we will instantly get our new bodies as well. We won't even have to die first. We'll move directly from this body to the new one. So the rapture, as it has come to be known, or the resurrection, which is the way the Bible talks about it, the resurrection happens in a, few, in a moment when God is ready to close the door on the church period, when the church itself has come to its end in God's plan, and he has all those believers ready to receive their new body. So in the question that was just asked of us, they said, why uh, is this happening uh, when our Savior has already been resurrected? Well, it's actually the other way around. This is happening because our, our Savior is already resurrected. Paul says he is the first fruits of the resurrection. Think of it like this. What happened to Jesus will happen to us, more or less. We don't have to die on a cross, thankfully. He did that for us. But after that, everything that happens to him will happen to us. Jesus was resurrected, so will we. Jesus goes into the heavenly throne room, so will we. Jesus returns to earth to reign on the earth for a thousand years, so will we. That's the promise to the believer. We will follow in his footsteps. So he was resurrected in the first century. 
we will be resurrected when our time comes because we too need a new body to go with our new spirit and we will be with him in the heavenly realm now this is to the heart of your question you, you asked why don't we just get our new body at the end of the tribulation well if we had to wait till the end of the tribulation that would mean that at least some of us would have to experience the tribulation but thankfully God has already said we are not appointed to that wrath because it was not designed for us the tribulation doesn't exist for our sake it was something in God's plan for a different purpose for a different group of people not for the church so God takes us off the earth in the resurrection so that we are prepared to leave and be with Jesus in heaven as his bride while the earth is still undergoing the tribulation beneath and that's why we're taken out at that time if you want more information on these topics we've had now several questions on end times Ezekiel the rapture the millennial kingdom and the like look friends the best advice I can give you is if this is an area of interest for you we have a Bible study on the book of Revelation it's the best I know how to do it's everything I can tell you about that time in history all of it stuffed into one study take that study watch those videos watch them front to back watch them a second time if you didn't get it all that will answer virtually every question we just answered and probably every question that is going to be asked about the end times that's where I would suggest you go and if you study it you're going to learn a lot so that's my recommendation to you back to the questions can I explain the meaning of the red heifer well in the law of Moses Israel was required to do certain rituals to prepare the temple before it could be used so when or before the temple even the tabernacle so when God told Israel in the law I want you to design uh, build this place where you will meet with me and you will provide sacrifice and you will be able to um, atone for the sins of your people and so on he established rules for how to build the tabernacle and how it would be used but he also established rules for how it had to be prepared for use and specifically how it had to be cleansed for use uh, ritually speaking and one of the things that had to be done was that a certain perfect red female cow uh, had to be found and uh, judged as suitable and then that animal would be sacrificed and used to cleanse the altar and cleanse the temple for its initial uh, use and anytime that the temple had to be re-cleansed that was still the requirement and we haven't had a temple on the earth now for 2,000 years almost and as a result Israel has been without the opportunity to do sacrifice but we know according to the book of Revelation that there will be a time in the future after the Antichrist opens the door for Israel to return to their Temple Mount and continue to sacrifice again as they once did but if they're going to sacrifice that means they need to have a temple if they're going to have a temple again that means they have to cleanse it and prepare it which means they have to have a red heifer to do that so the reason you'll hear people talking about a red heifer sometimes is because there are those in Israel even now Orthodox Jews who desperately look forward to the day they can go back and sacrifice on their temple and they are preparing for that day to include trying to breed a cow that meets the legal requirements as that special sacrificial heifer for cleansing the temple so that's one of the reasons why you might have heard that uh, next question Jennifer asks uh, as it relates to BC and AD how are years recorded well uh, Jennifer you're in luck we actually have an article on our website uh, that gets into this in a very helpful way uh, because there is some confusion about that actually the dates that we commonly see used to date ancient history BC in other words um, or as some would say now BCE however you want to say it uh, that is based on a calendar that was put together by a Greek man called Ptolemy and there is some error in what Ptolemy did and if you don't recognize the error your dates get messed up and if your dates get messed up then they won't agree with the scripture but the scripture is correct Ptolemy wasn't in some cases and so we have an article that explains those differences and how to reconcile them uh, it's found on the website by searching for a question about the 77s of Daniel chapter 9 so just search 77s or 
Daniel 9, and you'll see a question on that come up. Read that answer, and you'll get your full qu answer on A.D. versus B.C. and how to count time in, in ancient terms. Uh, that would be a, a better way for me to give you the answer than to try to explain it all again now. By the way, we have hundreds and hundreds of questions on our, our website already answered, and the easiest way to find the one you're looking for is just to search. Just go into the answer section of our website, go to the search box, and just start searching on keywords, uh, phrases that you think might get you where you want, and you'll be finding all kinds of answers you may not have realized were out there, and you can learn a lot just by doing that. All right, we still have about 20 minutes or so, so let's go on. What does the Bible teach about practicing a breath, breathing, I guess, or contemplative prayer? Well, in a word, nothing. But here would be my personal advice on such things. Uh, first, prayer, by definition, is contemplative. What do you do when you pray? You contemplate what your needs are, what your desires are, what your uh, will is, and what your, your, your purposes are, and then you contemplate what the Word says and what God's will might be. And then you contemplate how to ask God about it. Then you contemplate what God might do about it. And, on and on. So contemplation is not some magical term or some kind of mystical behavior. It's just a fancy word for thinking or reflecting on something. And if, if that's all we're talking about, then the Bible's full of references to how to pray, and those references all direct us back in the same way, that you should pray consistently, without ceasing, and boldly going before the throne of God. And you will be well served in a life that is uh, dedicated to that behavior of prayer. And uh, how you breathe during your prayer is completely irrelevant. How you, uh, how you, what posture you take, I would suggest a posture of humility, like on your knees or head bowed, not because that's biblical or because it's, it means God will hear you any more than he would have otherwise. God always hears your prayers if you're a believer, but because it helps condition the attitude of your heart to understand you are going before the God creator of the universe with your petitions and at least a sense of humility is appropriate in those circumstances. Now having said all of that, if you get caught up in teaching that tries to make you believe that your prayer is either more effectual or more likely to be heard or answered by how you take on certain postures or breathing or mindset or mantra, etc. First of all, it's completely false. It's nonsense. Just stop listening to that. But secondly, it's bordering on the mystic and the occult. And you ought to be very careful with anyone who tries to pull you too deeply into that stuff because at the end of the day, knowing, following, and praying to our Lord God is nothing more than having a conversation in your heart with Him doesn't require any kind of fancy training, doesn't require anything difficult. You know, a, a five-year-old child knows how to pray, and then we become 50 years old, and we seem to think we've forgotten how to do it. Just do the simple thing you knew the first time, and you'll be fine. But more importantly, do it consistently, and do it with a sincere desire to go before God with your needs, knowing and trusting He's hearing you. That's enough, in my opinion. Next question. David said, I fear grieving the spirit, but I'm not, uh, David uh, asked this question, I fear grieving the spirit, but I'm not fully sure what this means and how best to avoid it. Can you explain? Well, uh, David, let me reassure you, if you don't know how to grieve the spirit, then you have no reason to be afraid of it. Uh, grieving the spirit is not something you do unconsciously or something you can accidentally do without knowing it. Grieving the spirit is very simply disobeying the word of the Lord and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you this: uh, Did you ever, uh, ac did, did you ever worry about whether you were grieving your parents without knowing it? I doubt it. I'm pretty sure when you were grieving your parents, you knew it very well. And your Father in heaven is no different. You know in your heart when you're grieving Him. You're grieving Him every time you engage in willful sin. You're grieving Him every time you decide that you want to set aside the disciplines of the faith or you want to cease becoming a servant of God in your church or anytime you neglect the study of God's word or prayer. I mean, we all do these things. So to an extent, we are always grieving the spirit in our sin. But in the way that that term is used by Paul in his letter, he's, he's talking specifically, though, uh, about those 
who make this kind of negative behavior a lifestyle. You know, Christians who walk away from serving God and from their own spiritual growth and do so in a wanton fashion, unrepentant, without looking back. That is a grieving of the Spirit because remember, that person remains a child of God by faith. They remain saved. You cannot sin your way out of God's grace. You know, you didn't earn your salvation because you did good things. And likewise, you're not going to lose salvation because you do bad things. It's not about what you do. It's about faith alone. And your faith, a gift from God, is there forever. So when a believer decides to go on this trip of prodigal son wanton behavior, they're bringing the Spirit along with them. He's there inside them. He's along for the ride. Whatever sin they engage in, they're bringing the Spirit with them into that moment. That is grieving the Spirit. So you know when you're doing it because you're doing it when you're disobeying God. But if you do it habitually, then you've crossed the line into what the Bible speaks about when it says, don't grieve the Spirit. Don't become someone who makes disobedience to God a lifestyle. For there is a consequence for that for the believer. It is not a consequence of losing salvation, but it is still there, and it is still meaningful. The discipline of the Lord in this life, which is not something you want to experience, and the potential that you may lose eternal reward in the kingdom, and neither do you want that. So let's all do our best not to grieve the Spirit. Next question. Can you explain what a lukewarm, lukewarm Christian is? Well, uh, I do that at, in great detail as part of our Revelation study because that's where the term shows up, as you might know. In Revelation chapter 3, as part of uh, the letter written to the church of Laodicea. Let me suggest to you, that's the best place to go to hear that answer. In, in short, it's a description in the Bible for someone who claims to be a believer but is not. Lukewarm, they uh, are not hot, they're not a believer, they're not cold, they're not an atheist, they're not obviously unbelieving. They've thought they are something that they're not. They say they are rich and and in need of nothing, and yet they do not know they are blind, miserable, and naked, and poor, as Jesus said. So they, they are somebody other than who they think they are, and that's what the term means. But to get the full context of why we know that is true, go listen to that lesson in the Revelation study that covers the, the letter of Laodicea, and you'll get the full explanation there. I, I would just think that's the best way for you to get that answer. So that's where I would send you. Next question. We have uh, about 10 minutes left. Uh, the next question is, what encouragement would you give young people who are still very connected to this world? That is, they're looking forward to being a student or uh, looking forward to adulthood and, and independence. And uh, perhaps they're actually fearful of the rapture because they don't want to miss out on this world if the rapture happens too soon. Well, uh, so I understand the question. And the simple answer is, anyone who would rather have this world than the next is simply showing evidence of how immature they are spiritually, how little they know about the future, how little they understand about God's plan. And the solution to that is not a hard one. It's just teaching them more about what is coming. You know, the only reason you, you value this world more than the next is because you don't understand what the next one brings. And for that matter, you don't understand how terrible this one is. Would any of us as adults, perhaps older adults like me, would any of us wish our children to experience 40 or 50 years in the world that we see around us right now when the alternative is 50 years in the perfection of the kingdom? I mean, only the cruelest parent would want that. No, the, the answer for any believer who understands the future as the Bible presents it is to want for the Lord to return quickly. As John said, come quickly, Lord Jesus, because the life you'll have in the kingdom is everything you know about this world with all the bad stuff gone. You're going to have a home there like you have a home here. You're going to have a job there like you have a job here. You're going to eat. You're going to drink. You're going to have friends. You're going to have things you enjoy doing, places you'll go and see. You'll have responsibilities that you look forward to. You'll have uh, material possessions that you enjoy using. Look, there's nothing about this world that is better than the one we have coming. Everything about I, what I just said is given to us in the Bible. And for someone who's young and thinking this world is better than, than heaven, here's why they think that, in my opinion. They think that because heaven to them is little more than what they see in a Hallmark greeting card. 
someone on a cloud with a with a harp and they wonder who would want that that sounds like nothing I want to have part of well they're right it's nothing you're going to have a part of it's not what the future holds for us but when you set them down and you explain to them what the millennial kingdom will be like uh, you'd have to be a fool to want this world over that one but that's the problem in the church today if I can get on my soapbox for 30 seconds the reason this ministry exists the reason I started it, the reason I do what I do every day, is because the world is filled with churches that are not teaching the Bible. And we have believers growing up in churches where they think the, the height of the Christian experience is a giant band on the stage with a laser light show and brownies after the small group meeting. And they don't get why anything else matters because they don't see anything else in the church that gives them any reason to want for what God has said is coming. Meanwhile, they see a world in which it's full of excitement and reward and challenge and interest and so on, and they can't imagine that heaven could be any better than that. Here again, that's why this ministry exists, so that we can write those, that balance again, so that the scripture can be held up for what it says, and believers will finally get their head out of the world and back into the Bible and understanding what's coming, so we'll be ready for it. And if our kids are there in the world with us, it's probably because they're either in a home or in a church where they're not being taught properly and they're all ignorant about what's coming. Teach people the Bible, and as we like to say here at my church, teach the Bible and good things happen. And that's my advice for someone who's in that situation. Uh, I do get a little worked up over it because I feel so much desire for people of all ages, but especially young people, to know what's waiting for them in the Bible. It would correct so much of what we see going wrong in the world right now if Christians had eyes for eternity instead of living the world in the world the way everyone else does and then just calling ourselves Christian. All right, sorry for the soapbox. I got off it now. I'm back to myself. Um, let's go to the next question. What's the difference between Reformed and Evangelical? All right, well, let's talk about that. First of all, those are two terms that you hear thrown around a lot to describe the church as it exists in various places. Uh, evangelical churches, for example. Or uh, you might hear someone say, we are a reformed church. Well, let's talk about evangelical. Evangelical is a term that uh, came into vogue in the last century. It's really just biblical Christianity. Evangelical, to evangelize is to have an attitude that says, I want to share what I know about the Bible and about Jesus with anyone I can because I know that's what Christ told me to do. So an evangelical church or an evangelical person is simply a way of saying a Bible-believing, Bible-living believer. And that person is evangelical because the Bible is evangelical. Christ was evangelical. Everyone who believes what Christ said is evangelical. That is, we believe in the necessity of faith in Jesus Christ for salvation and the importance of sharing that gospel message with as many people as we can. And churches that hold to that general value and hold the Bible in high regard are more or less considered evangelical. Now within evangelicalism you have different categories of churches based on their theology, what they believe about the Bible. So you might have a church that says we are reformed. They are evangelical but they are reformed in the sense of how they believe the Bible teaches. Reformed comes from the Reformation, which is the period of history in the mid-16th century where John, uh, uh, John Calvin, Martin Luther, uh, uh, Bruce, several other well-known people you would recognize were part of a general movement in Western Europe to break the church free from the influence of the Roman Catholic religion, which had largely corrupted the teaching of the church and hidden the truth of the Bible from most people. And as that breaking, breaking away took place, those leaders of the Reformation began to establish new doctrine to replace the bad doctrine of the Roman Catholic religion. And as time has gone on since then, people who believe and agree with all of the teachings of those early leaders of the Reformation, they've come to calling themselves reformed. It's a simple way of saying we carry on the beliefs of Martin Luther, John Calvin, and others. Uh, in some ways that's good and in some ways it's not so good. There are certainly some strongly held beliefs among the reformers that were good beliefs. 
but there were also some very bad beliefs. Uh, the reformers, for the most part, were notoriously anti-Semitic. Uh, they wrote books. Uh, Martin Luther is uh, well known for writing a terribly anti-Semitic book, very anti-Jew, very hateful to the Jewish people. Despite being a man of God who helped the church rediscover the truth of Scripture, nonetheless, he wasn't perfect, and he had this blind spot when it came to Israel. He was very anti-Semitic. So was John Calvin. So were others in that period of history. And as a result, their theology reflects that anti-Semitism to the degree that they do not believe that God has a purpose with Israel any longer. They believe Israel was set aside after they rejected Jesus and that all the promises in the Bible that were spoken to Israel are no longer for Israel, but rather for the church. And that's why Reformed theology is sometimes called replacement theology because the church replaces Israel in God's plan, according to the Reformers. That is not a view that is consistent with the Bible, not my view, certainly not the view of the, the ministry. So we don't call ourselves Reformed because we don't want to confuse anyone according to our beliefs. Uh, we are evangelical, though. So those are the, that's the relationship between those two terms. Uh, Shannon asks, what do you believe were the Nephilim in Genesis 6? Who are the sons of God that came to the daughters of men? Uh, well, I'll answer it here briefly, but again, that's one we have on the website. If you're interested, just go search on the term Nephilim or sons of God, and you'll see the answer in detail. We also talk about it in, Gen in Lesson 6 of the Genesis study. The short answer is that in Genesis 6, we're told that the Nephilim are the primary reason of the flood. That there was a time right before the flood when Satan allowed his demons to begin taking human women and mating with them in some way that we obviously don't understand. And the result of that union was a kind of offspring that had a human body of some form, but spiritually it was demonic. And the introduction of, of demonic spiritual power into this new form of humanity created a creature that wasn't exactly human, but wasn't but, but had flesh, it had a body. It was called a Nephilim, and the word doesn't even have a translation. We don't know what it means. It's just a proper name. And the Nephilim, we're told uh, in Genesis 6, were uh, a kind of offspring that were, jar that were uh, uh, bigger and stronger than, than typical humanity. Now, why did the demons want to do this? Why was Satan doing this? Well, simply put, he was trying to destroy the human race. God had said back in the garden, that the way he would correct for sin was he would bring a Messiah. That Messiah would ultimately crush Satan. We're told that, uh, we're told that in Genesis chapter 3 in a, in a section of Genesis 3 called the Proto-Evangelium, or that's fancy for the first or the primary gospel, the first gospel. So Satan heard that, and he knows, ah, I'm going to be destroyed by someone that God is going to send through the line of humanity through a birth process. So Satan had the idea that if he corrupted the human race with these Nephilim, they would reproduce and spread, and over time they would take over the planet, and then there'd be no humanity to produce the Messiah, because the Messiah couldn't come from these demonic creatures. So this was his way of polluting the human race. God saw that. God knew that it would be a problem, and that's why he told Noah that his spirit could not strive with man's flesh forever under those circumstances. And as a result, he had to wipe them off the face of the planet and start again with Noah's family. So the sons of God is a reference to these demonic angels, and the daughters of men of, that they mated with are human women, and the product is Nephilim, a kind of demonic creature that came out of these women at birth that had the potential to ruin the whole plan of God. So God destroyed all of them along with all the rest of humanity with a flood and let Noah and his family start again so that then he would not have to worry about these Nephilim anymore. By the way, Peter tells us that the demons who were responsible for that mating process were then put in prison in the abyss so that they wouldn't try that a second time. And the rest of the demonic world saw what happened and realized they couldn't take that tactic any longer, which is why we've never seen it happen again. That's a good question. Well, we are at 8 o'clock. Let me see if there's a quick one we can throw in here at the end. 
What are the best history books to read to become a better student of the Bible? Good question, and I have a fast answer for that. It's on our website. If you go to the website again under the question section, go to the search box and search for what resources does Steve use? And we have an answer for that question, and it includes a long list of all the resources that I commonly refer to, many of which are history books that are great for getting a background on the church age or on ancient history, um, and I would send you there. By the way, here's a, here's a dirty little secret. You might not think this is true, but it is true. Wikipedia is actually pretty good. I'm not saying it's always right, but it's well-researched and it's well um, regulated you know it's a public forum and so people tend to debate what history should say and they tend to narrow it down to what's best and I'm not saying it's always right but you might learn a whole lot just by going through Wikipedia and searching history of nations like Babylon or Persia or whatever so before you start spending a bunch of money on history books spend a little time on Wikipedia I'll tell you that from my experience at least on major topics it tends to be very good hopefully that helps you all right, well, I am going to call it there, friends. It's 8 o'clock. Uh, I can already feel my voice getting a little tired. <laughs> I've been saying a lot in a short time, but I wanted to answer as many questions uh, as I could. Hope this has been helpful for you. Don't forget our website is there for you anytime you need. We've got all the resources that uh, we can offer there for you for free. And uh, use our Q&A section, see if you can find your answers there. I know we'll be doing more of these in the future, so just keep an eye on Facebook for us. Uh, when we have those uh, set up, we'll schedule them. You'll be able to know they're coming and then you can get your questions ready for that. And before I sign off, let me remind you, uh, if you're in the San Antonio area, we have had our local church closed since March because of COVID, but this weekend we're opening for the first time in six months. Uh, on September 20th, we re resume our weekend services again. Uh, I'm still teaching through Matthew, but now with a room full of people, which will be a nice change again. And if you're in the local area and you're looking for a church home and you'd like to join us, uh, please, by all means, come by, visit us, and I'll try to shake your hand when you're here. Or in our new COVID way of doing things, I'll just bump elbows with you or whatever we do now, but we'll say hello. And um, next Wednesday, as always, we do the Wednesday night teaching in Second Samuel. I'll be online again for that as well. All right, guys. Thanks for being with us here tonight. Appreciate your questions. If you didn't get your question answered tonight, send it to us through the website or come back with it next time when we do this again. God bless you guys all. Have a great night. We'll see you later.